morning that are on my heart, and last night I was kind of moving in a different direction, but I wanted to finish this morning. I just felt I needed to finish what we did last, we started last week, because it kind of moves into where we're going to be going, and we're finishing up this week with our instruction on baptism, and there's so much more we could talk about, but I just want to finish up this Romans passage. So if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6. We're going to finish up those verses there this morning, and, uh, and then I want to get into, I want to move into church membership after that. Basically, what is it to belong to a church? So last week, we talked about a number of things, and I told you I would have a PowerPoint, so we'll see how that goes. Um, if we can actually see it, this would be great. And just as by review, and I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, but we'll review through some of this stuff, and then we'll, we'll move into finishing that passage in Romans chapter 6 and what that, how that speaks about baptism. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you this morning for your word, that it speaks truth no matter where we are with it. What page we turn to, there is truth. And there is truth about you, Father, and we thank you for that. You are speaking God, and because you speak, we know. We, we are informed. We know who you are. We know your promises. We know how, that, why we can depend on you. We are reminded of how to walk with you, Lord, how to trust in you, how to depend on you. This morning, Father, I pray that we may understand our position in you, that through faith we have believed and we have received the gift of eternal life, and that outwardly we proclaim that we've been placed in you by your Spirit, but we outwardly we proclaim that through the ordinance of baptism. So this morning, Lord, you take this and you use it to your glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So last week, ah, we're going to be able to see it, okay. If you can see that, great. If you can't, well, we'll just, it's just a review from last week. Uh, our sins, the profession of our faith in Christ, this is what... Baptism is, it reminds us of Christ's humiliation and death as he identified with the sinner and his resurrection from the dead. So in a nutshell, that's what our outward form of baptism is. That's what, our, that's what we're doing when we go down into the water and come up. We are identifying with what's taken place in our life already. With his death, burial, and resurrection portrays the radical nature of our conversion. And that's the one thing that I kind of want to, I've been honing in on and I wanted to kind of plant on last week is that the point of this symbol, the point of our immersing in water is that we want to demonstrate what radically has taken place within our lives. We have been placed in Christ through faith. We have received new life in Him. We now are secure in Him, reside in Him, placed in in him, and that's what we're doing when we do this on the outside. Uh, baptism is an ordinance performed only once in the church. We talked about that. Whereas the Lord's Supper is an ordinance that's done over and over again to remind us that we never stop living a spiritual and spiritual nour nourishment that comes from the death of Jesus for our sins. Um, baptism was universally practiced in the early church. Paul assumed it should be. And we live in, um, living in sin and contra con uh, contradicts their baptism. So, um, let me just continue to move on here. Uh, I thought this would look good. It looked good on the computer, but it doesn't look very good on the slide. Um, baptism is by immersion, not sprinkling or pouring. Some verses that we gave you last week, John 3, 33. Um, John's baptism, Mark 1 to 4, prepare the way of the Lord. We talked about John's baptism. We spent some time on that what that was about. And I'm not going to rehash that because we did spend quite a bit of time on that. But God's kingdom is both moral and ethical. Okay, so it's turning from sin and towards righteousness. So symbolized through baptism by immersion is that we have turned from sin towards righteousness by means of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus' baptism recognizes John's baptism as authentic, and the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus, indicating that Jesus will baptize, uh, immerse one who by faith in Jesus believes and repents with the Holy Spirit. 
Um, so this is an identification process. So upon salvation, we are permanently placed. I told you last week, this passage in Romans is about we are permanently placed in Christ at salvation. We are united with him. He never loses us. He never says, well, you sinned today, so you're not saved anymore. That's the whole point of this Romans passage, is that you are baptized, immersed in Christ upon salvation. And then, and Paul is using, if you remember I said last week, Paul is using the illustration of water baptism or the, the outward identification, the outward proclamation of what took place inwardly to explain to us, to picture for us what happened. What, what, what happened to us when we received Christ? We were placed in him, immersed in him. So that was John's baptism. Uh, and then there was the water baptism of Jesus. Well, what was that? It was the physical analogy of water baptism to a spiritual reality. So Jesus is saying, I identify with this symbol. I identify with the fact that you need to repent, turn from your sin, and believe in a Savior. Okay, I, I identify with that. Repent, turn from your sin. All right, but in my kingdom, it's going to be a moral and ethical kingdom. And the only way there's going to be change and the only way there's going to be repentance is if you believe by faith in me, in Christ. And so that he was identifying saying, yes, John, I agree with your baptism of repentance. But the repentance now that I'm going to bring about is repentance from your sin and placing your faith in me as Savior. So, Jesus commissioned to his followers, go make disciples, Matthew 28. Um, before we get to Romans 6, I did want to do this one thing. I, I know, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit. We're going to go to Matthew 28. Um, so, we're going to look at baptism. We're going to begin by looking at baptism as a symbol or an instrument in this passage. But before that, I want you to look at Matthew 28, because Matthew 28 is our instruction as a church. And this is really important because when we talk about, we've been talking about the church, right? We have been looking at various aspects of the church of Jesus Christ. We have been looking at what do we do as a church? Okay, why is it important that we do the Lord's table? Why is it important we baptize? Why is it, it's going to be, we're going to talk about why is it important that we have membership? Why are these things important to a local church? Well, we are given instructions in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, and you're probably all familiar with this. But in this chapter, there's what we call the Great Commission. The 11 disciples were at Galilee, uh, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations." So the first thing we see in that passage is that God has given Jesus authority on earth, authority to give power to the church to develop and to proclaim his mission. All authority in heaven and on the earth has been given to me, given to him from the Father. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So since I have authority to commission you to go and make learners, of others in the things of, of, of myself, Jesus is saying, Christ. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So the Father has given me authority on earth to commission you, that is the church of Jesus Christ, you and me, to go and make learners. Okay, to go and share this good news of Jesus Christ so that people might believe and trust and have new life. Now, what does that really mean here? Well, a couple things. And if it's. It means, first of all, that based on the authority the Father has given to the Son and the Holy Spirit to give the ability for his followers, you and me, his followers, are emissaries with an imperative to go. Go and make disciples. This is a, this in the Greek language is a present participle. It means go. Go and do. Don't wait for it to happen, but go and do. Go therefore and make disciples 
of all nations. What are we doing? We're making followers. Followers of who? Of Christ. How does this happen? How are you going to make followers of Christ? Because that inevitably is the mission of Jesus, make followers of himself. So you're going to do it this way. So you're going to make learners or followers of me of all nations. That means Jew, Gentile, everywhere on the earth. You're going to make followers of me, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And they're going to be identified with me. This is, this is water baptism he's talking about, immersion. So you're going to, they're going to identify with me in this outward symbol. It doesn't save them, as Romans 6 tells us, but it's going to be that outward symbol saying that, yes, I follow you as my Lord and my Savior. Yes, I have by faith believed in you and trusted in you, your finished work on the cross of Calvary, your resurrection from the dead and your ascension on high. I have believed in that message, and I am identifying with that by being immersed and coming out. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. And how is this going to happen? Well, I'm going to teach them, instruct them, to observe all that I have commanded you. And what does he say? How is this going to take place? Well, I'm with you always, even until the, end of the, until the end of the age. So I am giving you the power to do that. So I'm going to teach. I'm going to baptize. So this is a symbolic oath or allegiance. And here's what this... Oh, I thought I had a... Okay, somehow that got missing. Anyway, no problem. We can go on. Um, what is he saying here? You must go in order to make disciples. And the manner in which disciples are made is by preaching my death, burial, and resurrection. And the result of all that, making converts, converts aren't just supposed to be, well, now I have a head knowledge. Now I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I have trusted in His death and His finished work. But you know what? It means something more. It means that I take that knowledge and I teach people to use it. I teach them to have a full obedience in faith, in their walk of faith. So it's, it's, it's not just a matter, and, and I, I guess I overemphasize this maybe sometimes, but it's not a matter of just speaking words. And saying, okay, I showed up, I did my thing. It is about you and me. This isn't just for the disciples. This is for you and me. That we have an imperative to go out and share that message with others so they might learn, they might believe, they might trust, and that they might walk in full obedience. That means that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to one another. That's the point of the church. That's why the emphasis on what is the local church. You know, we have universal church. That's all believers everywhere. Then there's the local church. And what's its specific function? Well, one of its primary functions is that we make converts to full obedience in faith. That's our, that's our mission. You can't do that isolated. You can't do that on your own. You have to do that in body, in communion with each other. That's what he's talking about in chapter 28 of Matthew. Now, if you flip back with me to Romans chapter 6, let me just finish our thoughts on what Paul's argument is here. He began chapter 6 by saying, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And they said, By no means, and that's emphatic, by no means do you continue in sin that grace might abound. And some people will believe that. They believe that, well, the more I sin, the more grace. So I'm good. And Paul is saying, no, the more grace, the less you sin. That's the point of all that. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do we not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Okay, so what is the point here? Why do we not just keep sinning and get more grace? Because you've been changed. You are different. You are a child of the king. And as such, you have been placed in Christ, clothed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. You're baptized into his death. So you're buried 
therefore with him by baptism into his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's your position. Of everything else you read in Scripture, that as a believer is your position. You have died with Christ. Therefore, no longer can you claim and cling to their former way of life. No more can you say that it's okay to mix the world with my Christianity. It doesn't work that way. It, if you have been buried with Christ, you are now dead to sin and alive to him. So he's using then this baptism of immersion to, uh, to help us understand the baptism that we have in Christ, identified, immersed in Christ. And so he says, we walk in newness of life. For if I have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So the argument now is from the first verse, you're not enslaved to sin anymore. It's not your controlling master. It doesn't have sway over you because you are dead in Christ. So the overwhelming letter of the New Testament and the rest of the New Testament in Romans and the rest of the New Testament is that we are justified, we are declared righteous by faith alone because of the union with Christ that happens through faith. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, declared righteous by trust, belief in the Savior, we have what? Peace with God. You want to have peace? You want to be free of turmoil? Peace with God comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans 8.1 says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the saving function of faith is stressed in these texts and many others where baptism is not mentioned. So baptism doesn't save you. Going down in a pool of water does not save you. But it is an identification with what has taken place in your life by faith. So justification, that is freedom from condemnation, comes through being in Christ Jesus, and it comes through faith. Therefore, faith is the means of our being in Jesus Christ and the sole instrument of our justification. So where does that lead baptism then? That baptism then follows closely behind faith. Baptism signifies this great union with Christ, especially in his death and resurrection. The inner spiritual union with Christ comes through the inner spiritual act of faith, not through the outer physical act of baptism. Uh, and the book of Acts is replete with that. Every baptism that took place in the book of Acts is about people having been saved. You think of the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, the 3,000 that were saved in the beginning of Acts, they were all believed, they trusted, and were baptized. Um, and they created, their, their confession was created by faith. So when Paul explicitly relates faith and baptism, he does so in a way that shows faith is the instrument that unites us to Christ, not physical baptism. Galatians 3, 26 to 27, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. At, at the beginning of verse 27, he shows that baptism into Christ is neither an outward expression of faith or a proof of faith. But it is through faith that we are sons of God. In Colossians 2.12, Paul says, We have been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith. In the working of God, here again, it's the instrument of our burial and resurrection is faith. Through faith, baptism is not the instrument. The baptismal act appears to be the outward expression of his inward spiritual experience. So the words of Romans 6, 3-4 do not support the idea that baptism is the instrument of our belief 
or by going down in the water that that saves us in any way. So here's the point of Romans 6, 3 to 4. It doesn't contradict the teaching of the first five chapters of Romans, that we are united to Christ by faith and thus justified by faith alone. Instead, it teaches that baptism signifies, portrays, dramatizes, expresses outwardly our death with Christ, which was accomplished for us historically at Calvary, and then was applied to us experientially by faith. It is about new life to which these events are to lead. It is the purpose of our burial with Christ that we might walk in newness of life. Why have you been buried? Why is there this language of death? Because the writer Paul and our Lord, who inspired him to write this, who gave him the words, moved him along to write these things, wants you to understand that new life, a new walk, a new person happened at salvation. Empowered with new realities, walking in the newness of life. That's what he's trying to get across to us. In Romans 7, 6, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So all the stuff that people try to do, all the stuff we've tried to do, to kind of say, hey, that makes me a good person, or I'm not so bad, or I'm, I'm okay means nothing if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The scripture says all righteousness is as filthy rags. So any righteousness we try to muster up is like filthy rags. And actually, the actual Greek term for that is menstrual rags. So this is newness of life through Christ. So Paul, Paul does more than announce that, that this living is in a new age is the purpose of our identification with Christ and baptism. He also compares it to the resurrection of Christ, which leaves us then with the application to our lives. Right? How does this all apply? Ephesians 4.11, Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness, and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, good verse. You need to think about that for a minute. With all lowliness and gentleness, long suffering, bearing with one another in love, bearing with one another, meaning being patient with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And those, those practical lessons are things like, you know, before we get aggravated with each other and before we, we, we make statements or we do things that would bring harm to the body, we ask ourselves, how is this going to affect first my brother? How is this going to affect my Lord and the testimony that we have around us? When the unbeliever looks at the church, they ought to see the example. They ought to see what, who Christ is. They ought to be attracted at least to what they see and not put off by it. Paul's grounds, though, for the believer's present participation in life is the spiritual power of Christ's resurrection. And so this is, in a nutshell, what he has been talking about. So there's like one other thing that I want to talk about here, but, but really, what does this have to do? And last week I, I said that I believe baptism and membership are closely related to each other. And we're going to talk about membership next week, but baptism is an outward identification to the church of God. Understand that the church of God is community. You can't function by yourself. You have to function in community. That's what the Bible commands us to do. The community is together to build one another up, to love one another, to exercise our gifts towards one another. So to live on an island is contrary to biblical Christianity. So how do we identify with each other? How do we know who's real, who isn't? Well, the body of Christ identifies that in two ways. First, outwardly, 
the believer comes and says, I want to I want to publicly proclaim, I mean, when the believer first comes to Christ and the new creature in Christ, I want to outwardly proclaim to the church those of us who are believers already and can look at that person and best we can say, yes, we believe your testimony is genuine and we accept it and we affirm it. Because let's face it, community in the church has to be pure as pure as we can get it. We know the Bible says there'll be tares and wheat, and tares and wheat. There's going to be wheat and there's going to be tares growing up with it. But we need it to be as pure as we can get. And so the body of Christ does that. You, the body of Christ, examines that person and says, I authenticate that. So a person goes down in the water and says, yes, I trust. They give their testimony. I've trusted in Jesus Christ by faith. I believe on him as my savior. I believe that he died for my sins. He rose again. You know, God saying, I authenticate this, that this is indeed, I am satisfied with this. You know, and, and resurrection again, that, and also, you know, the conquering of death and um, that that last enemy, death, is, will be conquered. And, but I identify with that. I identify with his resurrection. That he's ascended unto the Father. And the church says, we believe that. We believe that you are a genuine believer in Christ and we, and we ask you to come into fellowship. So I, I, it's hard for me to say that let's get baptized, but don't become a member. Because membership, I am identifying with the body of Christ, the local body of Christ. That body is saying, yes, we believe you are part of our community. We believe that you are authentic. And we want to be a minister to you. That's one aspect of membership. We do that as an authentication that indeed you are part of the body of Christ. And purity is what God is looking for. So we're going to get into that next week. But that's kind of where I wanted to go. As I said last week that I believe they're closely tied together. So it is difficult for me to baptize somebody without them desiring to become an actual member. Because you're actually doing that. The body of Christ is, not that I wouldn't, but I'm just saying that the body of Christ is saying that you are one of us. We authenticate your faith in Christ. And so let us be a part of your life and minister to your life. And there's, there's many other things we're going to talk about in that, but that's where we begin. The last thing I want to talk about is there are some out there who sprinkle, we call it pedobaptism, sprinkling infants. I just want to run through that quickly because I just want to be clear. Um, the practice of sprinkling, again, I, I told you last week that there are three words used for water, like dipped, immersed, as baptizo, and there's two other words for sprinkling. Every time in the New Testament when it talks about a believer being baptized, the word baptizo, baptizo is used, meaning to fully immerse. Now, it can have the connotations of pouring, but it always means complete. And there are those out there who believe in sprinkling infants. So I don't see anywhere in Scripture where there's warrant for that. There's no command to do this. And we can look at Matthew 19, 13 to 14, Mark 10, Luke 18. Um, all of that indicates that this has nothing to do with sprinkling infants. There's no scriptural example anywhere of this. A household believed, and you can look at Acts 10, uh, 11, 16, 1 Corinthians 1, and so many others where the household believed and they were baptized. The Philippian jailer, he believed, his, he and his household, and were baptized. Um, Philip, where's water? He believed, he trusted by faith, and he asked, the, the eunuch asked Philip, where's water? And he said, right here. And they went down and, they, and he was baptized. And, and we can go into that over and over again. Every instance is about a statement of faith and an action to follow it up. So there's no passages in Scripture that even apply this. Um, the practice is expressly contradicted by teaching of Scripture. Baptism follows evidence of repentance and faith. Now, let me just say this. The reason some people do this is because historically in church history, 
even back with Luther and Zwingli and some of those others, they were still tied into that Catholicism that your faith could be transferred to the infant. So by reason of your faith, they would be baptized. Well, that has no merit in Scripture anywhere. Everywhere where a person is baptized, they expressed an understanding of their faith in Christ. They placed their faith, they were able to articulate that and understand it, and were baptized. So it's an expression of a conscious, conscious, voluntary union with Christ. And by the way, even towards the latter, latter parts of Luther's life, he was getting further and further away from um, pedo-baptism. So um, that's, in a nutshell, I mean, there's, there's a lot more to say about that, but we're not going to belabor that. Um, basically, that whole, really up until about the 16th, 1700s, it, there was no sprinkling of infants. It really is only until the, the church became political, the Catholic Church arose, and then it became a practice. But there's nowhere in Scripture where that particular mode of baptism is done. So it has to be a, I understand what I've done by faith. In faith, I trusted in Christ as my Savior. In faith, I believed on his finished work on the cross of Calvary for me. And now I want to testify before the body of Christ that this is indeed what has happened to me. That is a thumbnail version of sprinkling of, of infants, but we don't do that. And um, I know there's baby dedication where the parent says, we, we will promise to, to raise this child up for the glory of you. And um, I get a little bit hesitant in, about that also because I'm afraid there's, at, at times, I think sometimes there's a, a confusion as to what we're doing. You know, so I'll just leave that with you for that. So that's, that's the, the ordinance of baptism, and that's why we do this. Romans chapter 6, one of your go-to chapters for that. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Mark chapter 1, John's baptism. All, and, and on through the Acts and the epistles, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. It's always an outward symbol of an inward transformation. And then the body of Christ brings us into community by saying, yes, we agree with that. We want to be part of your life. We want to help you grow in the things of Christ. You are dead to your sin and you are alive to Christ. As such, serve one another with lowliness and meekness of heart, with passion for each other, with a desire to see each other grow up in Christ. That's really the message of the gospel, to help each other grow up in Christ so that we are perfected on the day of salvation when we get before him. I was involved in your life. You were involved in my life. We helped each other grow to the glory of him. That's what we do as a church. That's why we meet. One, one of many reasons, but the, the majority reason. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for all that you have shown us in your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can, through this, this ordinance of the church, demonstrate that we indeed have new life in Christ. Father, I think of the psalmist who said that unity of the body is like oil running down the beard of Aaron and onto his robes. Father, what a a marvelous picture of our life in fellowship with one another. 
It is like the dew on the mountain. It settles. Again, the picture of our fellowship with one another. Might we burn that image in our hearts? Might we understand the message Paul has taught us? That we are dead in Christ by faith, by grace, through faith. 